This is TWIS, This Week in Science, episode number 494, recorded on Wednesday, December 17th, 2014. Let's get geophysical. You know you want to finish that song. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki and this is This Week in Science. And today we are going to fill your head with a lightning bolt, gamma rays, and some animals doing fun tricks. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Twas the night before Twistmas when all through the house no science was stirring, not even on a mouse. The stories were laid by the webcams with care in hopes that the minions soon would be there. Blair was already hiding her bed while visions of peacock spiders danced in her head and Kiki with her lab coat and an eye on the moon preparing our brains to bring the show soon. When all of a sudden there arose such a chatter, so to the chat room I sprang to see just what was the matter. The minions were there, and the minions were ready for the show to begin and the news to come steady. I opened a window and saw with surprise that a Google Hangout was going, about to be live. I looked for my invite. I found it in text, just in time for This Week in Science. Coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go. To find the knowledge I seek, I wanna know what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. What's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. Good science to you, Kirsten and Blair. Good science to you, Justin and Blair, and everyone else out there. This is This Week in Science, and it's almost Twistmas. It is. Wonderful intro today, Justin. That was so much fun. Bravo. Well done. Well rewritten there. Anyway, today we've got a great day of science ahead on this week's show. I've got tons of stories about organics and gas and gamma rays and cholera. That sounds enjoyable, right? Yeah. <laughs> what do you have, Justin? I've got drugs. I've got hypoallergenic hijinks. I've got water discovered on planet Earth. What? Yes, got to oh, be kidding I've got a lot of pet mammals to talk about. Yeah, stupid mammal tricks. Hmm. Blair, what do you have? Oh, I have lots of uh, very young versions of things. I have snail eggs, I have ant eggs. Then I have everybody's favorite, the Arctic ground squirrel. <sighs> and maybe if there's time, a robo tuna. We'll see. Robo tuna, robo, robo your tuna. No, that didn't quite work. Anyway, but do you know what works really well? What works really well, Kiki? Science. Science. Works really well. It does work really well. And there is science happening on Mars. This week I've been hanging out at the American Geophysical Union annual meeting at the Moscone Center in San Francisco, California with thousands, tens of thousands of geophysical planetary people. I mean, it is insane. I am so overwhelmed by this conference, I don't even know how to explain it all to you. All I do know is that instead of giving free cookies at this conference, they give away free beer. They're serious. Really? They are serious at this conference. One of the things that they've been very serious about is NASA science. And there's been a lot of great news out of NASA. I was at a press conference uh, yesterday, two days ago, where they, uh, where NASA scientists presented data from Mars taken by Mars Curiosity rover, which is roving all around the planet, digging holes, sniffing the air with laser beams. And... Um, the, they also, it's also called the Mars, Mars Science Laboratory because it's a rolling science laboratory. It's able to do experiments. And uh, they have taken 
samples of soil. They dug holes in various places, and at this Mount Sharp, Cumberland crater, this er, this sample area they're calling Cumberland, um, they dug a hole and they found immense signals for uh, organic molecules, chlorobenzene. Organic what? molecules. You know what organic what? molecules are, you guys? They're molecules that we suspect could only be created by organic material? That's about it. So, organics. We are organic. Carbon-based is organic. Um, the cool thing about this is we, we still don't know whether or where the this chlorobenzene has come from. They've done all sorts of tests back here on Earth to try and make sure that it's not an artifact that or an accident that suddenly happened in the Mars Science Laboratory because they don't really have a way to control what's happening there. So if something falls into one of the sampling wells or one of the, the instruments and gets in the way somehow, they don't know that, and so we have to test for things back here on Earth to make sure that no accidents have taken place and that this is the signal that they're actually getting. And so this is not an artifact. This is a big, strong signal of chlorobenzene. Chlorobenzene could have come from biological origins, microbes producing, um, producing organic matter, but it also could come from geochemical processes, so uh, hydrogen sulfate and stuff below the below the surface of the soil mixing together with water and there are several chemical processes that can take place to actually create these organic molecules um, so that they would be found in the earth and so now what the researchers are trying to do with respect to the organic molecules is just look at different rocks dig more holes and try and deductively categorize soil types on Mars so that they can recognize spots with the right kind of soil to harbor organic molecules. And so that's what the that's what their next step is is to just keep getting like refining their method and being good scientists saying well this worked or this didn't work this didn't work so let's try this and so they're going to try and get rid of all the hypotheses that they can to narrow down our focus as to what the real source of these organic molecules actually might be. So it's kind of, that's kind of neat. And then the methane, I saw Justin, you wanted to talk about the methane also. Mars, is, go, Mars is burping or right. farting, really. <laughs> One of the researchers. I knew it. <laughs> that's right. Mars has gas. Mars mm -hmm. has gas, people. Um, Mars, uh, along this trip that the Mars Curiosity rover, rover, rover has taken, it's been sniffing the air, and it's got this turntable laser interferometer that uses this infrared laser that goes doo -doo 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 back and forth 81 times inside of this chamber that gets filled with air to be able to get a, get a sense of what is in that air. And things that they have found in the air include methane and they've gotten this is methane has been found in the air on Mars previously we know it's in the air but what is interesting about this finding is that they've honed down their understanding of what the background level of Mars Mars's atmosphere is like how much methane is concentrated in the atmosphere and they've they've measured it to be about 0 0.7 parts per billion of methane on kind of their background level. So that's what's usually there. And then they sniffed a couple of times in this one area during the day and they all of a sudden phew, spikes of methane like 10, uh, no, 100 times what they've been measuring. So it was what, point seven what, parts, there, got, it went got, up to 7 I, parts per billion on average. What'd you say? I got, ten, well yeah, mine says 10 times. The spike is 10 times higher than the background. But. Well, if you, yeah, 10 times, that's right, it's 10 times, so 0.7, move the decimal place, 1, that's what I, I was doing bad math, 10 times, so it's 10 times the background signal, so it's from 0.7 to around 7 parts per billion, and um, this, this is not up. enough. This shows up, and then, go, and it shows and then up goes and then away, it just disappears. So it's something active, this isn't just a background, this is, this is like a cloud, Poof! 
it lingered and then it dissipated and exactly. was gone again. Exactly. And so, so I mean, that's active. That means active now methane production. Something burbling out of the subsurface, perhaps. Yeah, so they don't really know exactly where it's coming from. It... Well, <clears throat> yes, uh, but... I, in this case, I think we can rule out the age old rule of smelt it, dealt it. Right. As I don't believe <laughs> curiosity is capable of producing. I think you're right that we can rule that out, absolutely. Um, however, uh, there are some interesting places where it could come from subterraneanly. Um, it could be held in, in, in solids, clathrate solids. We have them here on Earth and they're starting to become a, a problem or a question as to how much we are releasing methane into our own atmosphere from clathrates. Um, and so these clathrates, if they're deep down, the NASA scientists said that if they're deep, deep down, they're really stable and they'll probably be there for uh, millions of years without any trouble. But if they get broken loose and come to the surface, they break down very quickly and that's when that, re and that's when that release of methane could happen. So that means there's underneath the surface of Mars, things are moving. Things might be moving around. So Mars might not be dead. It might be very active. Yeah, definitely Mars has this reputation for being kind of this just dead, still rock. Right? We're yeah. seeing more and more. This is great. We're seeing that there's a lot more going on there. Yeah, a lot, a lot more going on there, which is so cool. Um, and then other things that are neat in looking at looking at our own planet from space, uh, we've also got lightning. Researchers have been looking at lightning using um, using satellites to be able to check out what el what other kinds of signals are being or what kind of energies are being released by lightning. They've determined that every time a lightning a bolt of lightning strikes or is released from a convective storm system, um, that lightning re releases X-rays and it also releases gamma rays. Now gamma rays are very high energy X-rays. And there are two kinds of, of gamma rays that get released. Some of them are kind of a lower amount of energy and they're, they la it, the, it lasts much longer. They're a little bit slower and they stick around for a while. And so this is something that pilots have even reported seeing that it, re it produces a glow in the clouds. And so it's kind of this gamma ray glow. Um, but additionally, there is a, a very, very fast Gamma, gamma ray that's released that is in the, it's called a terrestrial gamma, gamma ray flash and it's at energy levels close to what particle accelerators or black holes or exploding stars would be releasing and it's being, it's released, this terrestrial gamma ray, kind of terrestrial gamma ray flash is released whenever lightning, whenever lightning strikes. Wow. Yeah. Super high energy gamma rays get released so you know, you're flying in an airplane and, you know, you know my, it, they're all insulated and nice. And while we try to stay out of thunderstorms every once in a while, airplanes get, you know, bombarded by a, by a storm. You, they even get hit by lightning. Most planes, or it's, it's estimated that every plane in the United States is hit by lightning at least once a year, if not more. So if you're on one of those planes, you're not just getting surrounded by lightning, you're also going to get bombarded by x-rays and gamma rays. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Um, what they're thinking though is these particles and they're thinking of it in terms of these are um, particles that are released when electrons from the lightning bump into other particles in the atmosphere and so they create these these high, high intensity gamma ray flashes and um, but they're thinking it's kind of like particle accelerator physics that they're thinking that they'll be able to look backwards and track the x-rays and gamma rays back to the lightning to be able to actually learn more about the phenomenon of lightning itself. 
and that could be pretty neat because as much as we even we think we know about lightning, separation of charge, big clouds, suddenly something happens, triggers lightning and you have a big crack boom, we still don't know anything about lightning. So there are a wow. lot of questions. We don't, we don't know what? We can't right. predict it? We don't know? No, you cannot predict exactly uh. when a lightning bolt is going to come out of a cloud. We do not know. We don't, there are all sorts of things that, um, that are not understood yet about lightning, which is really, really neat. Anyhow, Justin, uh -oh. what you got for this week in science, everybody? So, we had, uh, we had the, the comet with the heavy, heavy water, right? We, we did the analysis of the comet. It's not the kind of water. It's not the water we've got here on Earth. It's different water. And it made us think, well, maybe it would have to be not a comet, but a closer in asteroid. Asteroids may not have water now, but maybe they did before. Maybe that's how the Earth acquired its water. Uh, there's also theories, though, that say the water that's on the Earth was there when the Earth itself formed and just stuck around, didn't come from anywhere else. Uh, the answer, the answer, according to Ohio State University researchers, is likely eh, both. Both of those answers are probably right. Both uh, asteroids from the inner solar system and water that was already here. This is a... Uh, Oh, this is the American Geophysical Union meeting on Wednesday. Reported discovery of a previously unknown geochemical pathway by which the Earth can sequester water into its interior for billions of years and still release small amounts to the surface via plate tectonics, feeding our oceans from within. And this is a pretty interesting study, uh, the idea being that the Formation of when the planet itself, rocky planet, formed, there was enough hydrogen there, and that the water that we have on this planet has actually been going through uh, a water cycle within the planet, uh, from deep, deep within it. They used, part of, it, part of this research testing, I just love this, they used uh, different forms of rock, and they, they, cr they basically destroyed them. They squeezed them. They compressed <laughs> them between diamonds while shooting them with lasers. That sounds like fun. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so they got to have a lot of fun blowing up rocks with it. It's called a diamond anvil cell. A device that squeezes a tiny sample of material between two diamonds and heats it with a laser. Simulate conditions of the deep, deep earth. And basically this experiment was basically how much water can you get out of a rock? Uh, <laughs> how, much, how, not, how much water can you squeeze from a rock? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was basically what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and At least it wasn't the, blood. The result of this is, as well as a connection to a, another study are saying basically that there is, in addition to the water that we know of on the planet's surface and in the atmosphere, about a Pacific Ocean's worth of water that is underneath. Uh, and that underneath, through different processes and plate tectonics and the like, occasionally rises up as other water seeps down into it. Uh, and so it's possible that the water that we have on our planet has been here the whole time the planet's been here. Interesting thing in this, <clears throat> I think, is when we're, we're talking about you know, our unusual planet, uh, our unusual planet and the, and the fact that we have surface water and... It's not all ice or it's not all evaporated as compared to the rest of our solar system. This, in a way, sort of, I, I'm thinking now, opens up the possibility for life or even hidden water reserves basically on any rocky formation planet anywhere in this galaxy or in this uh, solar system or throughout the galaxy. Which you would mean that Mars would have water. To get, huh? That, which would mean that, wa that Mars would have had some kind of internal water or could cycle. still. Or could still, since we're looking still. at the methane and it's active and or yeah. locked within the rocks itself. You know, yeah. I mean, if it's not as tecton tectonically active, maybe the process isn't there to get it to the surface. 
Uh, you know, if the atmosphere isn't formed, maybe it doesn't have the ability to keep it on the surface. These are mm -hmm. these are problems for every different planet to sort of have. We've got a nice mixture of the bunch. But you also, I, I love this because then you don't have to also get bombarded by a comet at some point to get your water. You know, <laughs> you can you can be you can be a planet out there that didn't get didn't get nearly destroyed a few times by comet impact and still have water. Or as uh, the Rosetta mission would have us possibly believe, not necessarily comets but asteroids. But you'd still have water. Well, well, they didn't say yes, asteroid. They said no comet, but still possibly asteroid. But the asteroids uh, that we've seen really haven't been moist. Yep. I haven't seen a lot of moist asteroids. And the no idea is because asteroids. they're so close to the interior, they could have been icy and bombarding. Uh, but since we're talking about a time so long ago as Earth was not much more than a collection of asteroids when it was really forming and getting clumpy, uh, we could have been our own progenitor for the water. We could have been the own, our own icy asteroids and not needed uh, you know, input from other asteroids because we are from the same conditions. But if the water and if the water is here from the very beginning, from that very formation, from the icy clumps, then perhaps of rock, or within the rock, uh, just enough hydrogen for the geothermal processes beneath the Earth and the pressures to create the water. Either scenario, uh, eh, we got water. We know that much. Now <laughs> I got here. More than one scenario uh, available to us, though. I like Ed from Connecticut's comment in the chat room. Thor does science. <laughs> Superhero Thor subjecting them to high pressures and temperatures using a diamond anvil cell. <laughs> if only, if only. Everyone, this is This Week in Science. You know what time it is, don't ya? What? Wait, what time is it? She loves our creature, cry that's all. pet, little pet, no pet at all. Wanna hear about animals? She's your girl, except for giant pandas and squirrels that are both closer. Cha cha cha. Ooh. Hang on. Hang on. I get a break in between acts, you know. Phew. All right. So, uh, you know, uh, squirrels. I don't know any squirrels they're, personally. They're, they're messing up. They're messing up, guys. Um, oh, Arctic ground squirrels. Over, Arctic ground squirrels are making climate change worse. What? Yes. Arctic well, ground squirrels. Okay. Go ahead. Squirrels. Little teeth, big fluffy tail. <laughs> yeah. Making climate okay. change worse. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Are you There's saying no thing as an they're Arctic worse than squirrel? cows and people? <laughs> Well, I'm not saying they're worse, but I'm saying they're contributing. So I'm just saying there's another reason to not be super fond of little critters, and this is why. <laughs> okay. Because they dig into permafrost, and as we know, we've talked about it before on the show, permafrost is a great kind of lockbox shunk of a bunch of greenhouse gases. Um, really big one, it's a huge store of carbon, permafrost. And Researchers have recently found, following these little arctic ground squirrels around, that they are impacting the permafrost and releasing more carbon than we would have expected based on just rising temperatures. So in, in Woods Hole Research Center in Massachusetts, they studied these arctic ground squirrels and they saw that the the squirrels will dig into the permafrost, right? That's what they do. They're, they're soil engineers, so they, they dig down into the, into the permafrost, dig down into the soil, and then they make a burrow. They, so by doing that, they're mixing the top layer with the bottom layer, so the very cold with the not as cold, which is going to melt mm -hmm. ice, right? Um, they're also bringing oxygen to the soil, which then fertilizes the soil. Now you would think that would be great because then they'd be growing plants that would in turn suck up some of that carbon, but they're also feeding microbes in the permafrost and the soil which create methane and carbons. 
So it's looking like these little ground squirrels are giving us more than we had originally bargained for when it comes to this melting permafrost. Interesting. So they're basic. They're they're basically just they're digging it up. They're mixing it up. They're allowing it to heat and to let the methane out. Are they really widespread enough to have a massive? I mean, it's it's more than what would be normally expected mm-hmm. for the so, melt. But are they? I mean, yeah. how big is the difference? What are, do you have any percentages or? I don't have percentages. I would say, in the grand scheme of things, it's not huge. I would say that humans and cows are a much bigger issue. And I would also say that if the permafrost wasn't soft from rising temperatures, they wouldn't be able to dig it anyway. Yeah, these squirrels are entering areas that they weren't before, and that's where this new impact is. So it's more of a positive feedback loop situation where these squirrels are, have new opportunities, and now they're turning soil they weren't turning before, and it's causing problems. So I brought it up jokingly to make fun of squirrels because we right. all know it's how I feel like, about them. It's like <laughs> Justin and cat stories in Toxoplasma. It, you and the squirrels whoa, and the pandas. Whoa, 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 it's like the it same kind the of same. thing. It's it the, is same the same kind of thing. W- it's similar. <laughs> but this is the reason I bring it up. Okay, This is the reason. Is that we assume and by we I just mean kind of like the general the window right now. Right? We assume that natural processes are just that natural and that they're usually good for the planet, right? But we see lots of things that are happening that usually building burrows, fertilizing soil, that'd be definitely two thumbs up. That'd be a great thing. But because of this very fast softening of the permafrost, it's causing these issues we weren't expecting. And so sometimes animals that are native to an area can cause an impact we weren't expecting. I thought that was pretty interesting. And then I have a couple stories about eggs. Are you guys ready for eggs? Invertebrate eggs? <laughs> Bring <laughs> it. Scrambled, fried. fried. Yes. Yeah. Or snail and ant. So um, ants, they have larvae and eggs in one colony or area. And so these little larvae, we think they're very kind of gross and squishy and helpless. Well, turns out they're a little terrifying. (laughs) And that's because they will cannibalize by that. I mean, they'll actually eat the eggs that are in the same nest as them to survive. Now, we're used to hive mentality where everybody helps each other with bees or ants because they're all kind of related. So it helps their genes to help their brethren in the hive or the nest. But what they're seeing is that there actually is chemical signaling telling these larvae which eggs are closely related to them and which ones are not. And they're cannibalizing in two situations. One, if the they're cannibalizing specifically the eggs that are less related to them. And two, if it's a situation where the benefit outweighs the cost, as in any risky situation in in nature, right? But what's even crazier is that they saw that male larvae engaged in cannibalism more than females. So that's interesting. So why would they yeah. think that the males are cannibalizing more than females? We know that. Males of other species will, during mating, they'll cannibalize offspring that aren't theirs for, you know, to be able to get their genes into the gene pool through mating. But if it's the offspring, are they just cannibalizing to increase their own their own energetic reward? It's possible. I would say that um, as a female, you are... Depending on the type of ant, depending on the type of species and all this kind of stuff, as a female, as a reproductive kind of hot spot, I guess, you can make a whole bunch of eggs as a female when you're mature, and that spreads your genetic material pretty wide. But if you're a male who isn't the biggest and the strongest, you're probably not having any babies at all. So it's possible that by cannibalizing as a larva, you grow up bigger and stronger, there's also less competition, that you benefit more cannibalizing as a male than as a female. Yeah, I don't know much about um, ant social structure hierarchy. They um, are they 
like bees where males are drones and female like their their roles in society how different are they do you know so I can look into it in the break but I think there's a few different kinds so I'd have to look at what this specific kind of ant was um, so I'll, I'll I'll say after the break what it turned out to be but um, it's it's something that in a non-colony living animal, you could see that right away. Be like, okay, yes, that is the benefit. Um, so that's kind of why my brain went there. Um, yeah. So a typical ant colony is one or more egg-laying queens and a large number of sterile females and then seasonally winged males. So that's just a general ant colony. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I have to look up the species. but. Yeah, there has to be some reason, and that's what this article said too, is there has to be some reason that there's a higher benefit for being a cannibal if you're a male than if you're a female. So that's they need their next grow, step. They need it to grow their wings. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> sure. I need to grow wings. You don't. Yeah. So I will, yeah, I'll look into their social structure for this specific species in the break, and I'll let you guys know when we get back. But I have to tell you about my favorite egg story of the show. All right. Um, snail eggs. Snail embryos can learn. So when we are growing inside our mother, they say all the time that a lot of things gets to the baby that, you know, you can have them listen to certain music. Definitely nutrition is a big thing, but a lot of things affect that baby. But that's, we always thought, you know, it's kind of because it's inside the mother. Everything the mother does, the baby gets. Well, these snail embryos in these eggs, they're able to learn, and they are a different snail when they're grown up based on what they're exposed to as embryos. So the example they gave was they took some snails, um, and then they exposed some snail eggs to a predator smell and some eggs not. And then when they hatched and grew up, the ones that were exposed to the smell of predators fared way better when exposed to actual predators as adults than the hmm. ones who didn't. They were just they were quicker to react to the smell. They recognized the smell. How did they? Because you would think you could actually have the opposite effect, right? Oh yeah, that they'd be used to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like oh, like, that's just that smell. I know. Yeah, that's, but that's so not... somehow that means there's a genetic component too, though. That yeah, they, genetic there's component. something ingrained saying that smell is bad. Yeah. That smell is scary. But the, or you know now I'm anthropomorphizing. That smell is to be avoided. There we go. So <laughs> um, then when they smell it in real life. So there's some sort of code inside of them going, that's a bad smell, and they're, it's more recognizable when they that and come across it in real life. Um, they also found that embryos exposed to the predator smell hatched out smaller than those kept in the predator-free conditions. Hmm. Mm, couldn't really figure out why that was. Maybe being smaller makes you less likely to get eaten. Or they're so, just, or they're just under stress. Maybe it's a stress, or there's there's some stress. kind of stress from the predator signal that impacts their development, so that they they don't grow as large. Right. Or it's, or it's just spite. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As soon as we're born, yeah. we're gonna get eaten. Don't give them a good meal. Don't yeah, but give them a good meal. Let's, let's slow down on the growing. I think the interesting thing here, though, is that it, it, it definitely has to be a genetic component because mm -hmm. how else do you, I mean, how do you know predator from your own food or mm -hmm. things that make you happy? Well, and that's this part of it. This is the third, like, kind of interesting dimension of this is that animals whose grandparents had experienced the predators in their life, those snails showed the biggest response. Wow. Which does show some probable epigenetic stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That there's some oh. kind of some kind of imprint laid down somewhere. Yeah. And then epigenetically that is enhanced and carried along the genetic line, the lineage. That's that's really interesting. It looks like, yeah, that they are handed that receptor 
perhaps, right, from um, the grandparents or the parents, and then the, the receptor is kind of exercised while they're in the egg, and then, I don't know, this is my receptor. I don't know. <laughs> I got so, you. I have a receptor. Feel free, feel free to send me your letters. I, it's fine. <laughs> so, and then, um, yeah, and then when they see it in real life, it's a trigger-fast reaction because mm -hmm. they're, they, they've worked out the receptor muscles before. <laughs> yeah, somehow, or... With olfactory stuff, it's really interesting because the olfactory system has very specific receptors for olfactory molecules. And so the question then is, does is this an enhanced nervous response where those receptors on neurons where the signal is, um, is propagated more efficiently and quickly, is that part of it? Or are there more receptors for that odor? You know, that's a good question. It's going to be pretty yeah. hard to figure that out on a snail, though, because they don't really have brains. <laughs> but they have neurons. Aplysia, the yeah. sea snail, is one of the model species for neurophysiological research. This can be done. Well, there you go. I just feel like it's much more difficult than on a mammal to check what's going on. Oh, you bet. You bet. But they have big old neurons, so... Yeah. Oh, they have a big nerve clump instead of a brain. <laughs> big nerve clump. And... So, even more That's fascinating. my band name. Even more fascinating <laughs> if they don't. If, if there they is don't. no difference in receptors or right. the smell or the transmission. What's going... Then you have no idea what's going on. Then, then, is it possible that there's a concept of some sort uh, going on. Well, it could be hormone-related, too. Mm -hmm. But it has to do with detecting that odor or whatever mm -hmm. the signal is. This is a, yeah. a, this is a communication kind of thing. There's, a, uh, there's something, and in this, say, this case they're saying an odor, a scent, the scent of mm -hmm. a predator, that is, it's a, that is a signal. And it is causing a response in the receiving organism, the snail. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be received somehow, right. whether by, and it's probably not by vision, so olfaction, we're going to be looking at the olfactory system. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, you know, it's like our skin where we have scent receptors on our skin. Like maybe there's something on the surface of the snail somewhere. We don't know where that thesis. slimy snail. That's a good thesis. Yeah. Yeah. How do snails get genetic memory? Yeah. How does it manifest? I look forward to reading your dissertation. That's right. All right, everybody. This is This Week in Science. Daddy, Babs, Babs, why isn't the egg man here? I'm starving to death for some eggs. And it's time for us to take a break. Eggs, eggs. We'll be back with more This Week in Science in just a few moments. Stay tuned. Shows the way to go. No conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. Put on a pair of goggles and go looking for the things I couldn't see. Hey everyone, this is the Twistmas season, and as per our annual tradition, we will be counting down the top 11 stories of 2014 at the end of this year. Our, we will have a special show, a special broadcast on December 30th, which is a Tuesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time to do so. So same place, just a different time. We decided to fit the show in. Because there's all these holidays on our normal broadcast nights. Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve. Ah, 
We had to change it around. So December 30th, 8 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, the top 11 of 2014 for your pleasure. And if you have any thoughts on what the top 11 stories should be, let us know. Email Justin, twistminion at gmail.com. I am Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, or you can email Blair Baz at twist.org. I believe that's correct. And uh, in doing so, you can also tweet us, hashtag top11 2014 over there on Twitter. You can tweet to at twist science if that's what you'd like to do. So many ways to contact us, but let us know for the top 11 of 2014 on Tuesday, December 30th, 2014 at 8 p.m. daylight, Pacific Daylight Time. And being the holiday season, you have one more week. Oh my goodness. One more week if you're the shopping kind of Christmas person. Um, otherwise, it doesn't really matter. Whenever, wherever. Merchandise. Twist has lots of merchandise in our Zazzle store, so go over to twist.org. Click on our Zazzle store link, and that'll take you to a place where you can purchase wonderfully twist and embossed, endowed paraphernalia. So hats, mugs, keychains, stamps, all sorts of fun things. Did you send your Twistmas letters with twist stamps this year? That would have been pretty fun. I should have done that. Why wasn't I thinking of that? Good gracious. Good gracious. Twist.org, Zazzle Store for your merchandise for the Twist Minion that you know and love. Twist is also supported by donations from listeners like you, and we currently have two different ways for you to donate. We have PayPal donation buttons all over our website, twist.org. So head over there, look for those wonderful PayPal buttons. Nice and easy if PayPal is your style. Also, we take donations through Patreon. The website is p-a-t-r-e-o-n, patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. We also have links over on our website so you can get there easily. Um, and whatever amount you're able to give, we really appreciate it. It helps us do everything that we do. It's going to help us do a live show in New York City on January 15th. 2015. That's right, New Yorkers, we're coming to ya. If you're in the tri-state area, January 15th, 2015, 10 p.m. It's kind of late, but the city that never sleeps, right? The Big Apple? Anyhow, you help us, you're helping us get there, you're helping us do that show. We're also going to have a fun meet and greet in February in conjunction with the AAAS conference in San Jose, California. These are things that are fun that we're going to try and do to give back to you a little bit for helping us do everything that we do. $2, $2,000, whatever you are able to donate, we really do appreciate it. PayPal, patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. If you can't afford a donation, we can always use your help getting the word about the show out, right? Tell your friends, your neighbors, your family, the people you work with, the guy next to you on the bus. If he's wearing earbuds, he might be listening to podcasts. I don't, I don't know. But anyway, you can just tell people about Twist. Spread the word for science. We thank you for your support. We really could not do what we do without you. And we're back with more This Week in Science. Oh, yeah. We are back, everybody. Justin, tell me a story. Oh, okay, okay. So, so if you've ever used a product on your skin and Once found or twice. that you've gotten a rash out of it, yeah. does that ever happen? It has. And then you look at the bottle and you go, but it says hypoallergenic. It must not be its fault. There's something else going on. Well, maybe. And quite possibly, no. There's there's something in what you just put on your skin that caused a rash. This is uh, American Chemical Society. 
report here. Uh, many consumers seek out shampoos, soaps, and cosmetics that are labeled hypoallergenic or dermatologist tested. Words that imply the products are safe to use. But recent research gives shoppers reason to question what those labels really mean. Nothing. Nap. Huh? <laughs> they mean nothing. Huh? Nothing? Yeah, that's quite possible. Quite possibly they could mean nothing. Some scientists and consumer advocates are calling for change, according to an article in Chemical and Engineering News, the weekly news magazine of the American Chemical Society. Britt E. Erickson, senior editor of CNEN, uh, notes that the definitions of the terms hypoallergenic and dermatologist tested recommended is currently left to the manufacturers that put them on their products to infer any whatsoever thing that they dictate that that actually means in human language terms. Food and Drug Administration has not set any standards whatsoever for using these descriptors on products. <laughs> Last time the agency attempted to do so was in the 70s, which for those uh, those who are who are listening who are below the age of remembering the 70s, it was a really long time ago. Cosmetic industry uh, giants Alme and Clinique challenged the regulation back then and ultimately won in an appeals court. Recent study on 187 personal care products formulated for children. These are this, they didn't even bother with the adults. These are specifically aimed at the products that are formulated for use on children show that most contain at least one known skin allergen even if they're marketed as hypoallergenic. <sighs> That's not okay. Yes. Some why? Companies... Because it's cheaper? Is that why? Because well, it's it's a couple of things. Some companies are self-regulating and moving away from certain compounds, such as those that release formaldehyde. Oh, that's decent. So decent. But that doesn't necessarily guarantee a safer product. Uh, and one preservative that some manufacturers have turned to in place of uh, parabens, which are endocrine disruptors, can cause allergic reactions. Some researchers are calling for the FDA to step in, but for now, it is up to consumers to shop by trial and error, uh, irregardless of what the label may state. Trial My and is error. So awesome. sensitive that awesome. even hypoallergenic <laughs> lotion not hypoallergenic. causes my rashes. No. My rashes cause my rashes. Right. Yeah. It may, you may not be overly sensitive. You might just have an allergy to something that they've put in their product. So are right. the False allergens cheaper than, like, making something with things that they know are allergens? Is that cheaper than making well, something that is actually hypoallergenic? Um, it doesn't go into the, here saying that it's necessarily cheaper uh, what this does indicate, though, is that they had other stuff that wasn't um, perhaps uh, and causing allergic reactions, the parabens, the endocrine disruptors, and have found substitutes for those other non-rash-causing, more actual harmful product, uh, components to things that can cause allergy but are less harmful mm. to majority of people. So, but but the point isn't that. I mean, you can make a safer product that's, you know, some people will be allergic to. The mm -hmm. point is the hypoallergenic uh, terminology is on the product regardless of what's in it. Mm -hmm. and, well, and this it's is... Not, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go. It's, it's just... It's just one of these things that, you know, you see on a product, you assume the words have a meaning that there is some sort of uh, structure, there's a process, there's a regulatory... Natural, use. organic, chemical-free, eco-friendly, eco yeah, all these words that are used. Mm -hmm. are, are created by marketing companies, not by any board of scientists who have gotten together and put up a list of what and cannot or must be involved in the product. To acquire and such a long sought, out, hard sought after uh, title. And technically, hypoallergenic would not mean not allergy causing. It just means less allergy causing. Less than. 
How about hyperallergenic? That would be like, we're going to cause you all sorts of allergies. Guaranteed. That's right. You want a rash that'll get you out of work for a week? Put that in all over your chest. Just all over. You want, do you want a hacking cough? Yeah. Well, maybe go on the Hajj. The Hajj. The holy pilgrimage to Mecca, the Hajj. Researchers have been testing the air for air pollutants um, around Mecca, and they have determined that it's like the worst, worst air pollution anywhere. Worse than Beijing, worse than Mexico City, worse than L.A. on a bad smog day. Um, That in Mecca, three to four million people, which is like adding another city worth of people to the city, in an area where there is absolutely no regulation of automobiles, or automotive vehicles with regards to the gas that they use, um, the filters in the engine um, that stop stuff, catalytic converters. There's no regulation for catalytic converters in um, in that area, and the, Sa- the Saudi government does not doesn't uh, regulate exhausts either. There um, there is no separation of pedestrians and vehicles as they are heading to the Grand Mosque in Mecca. So people very times in tunnels, the main tunnel leading to the Grand Mosque especially, they found carbon monoxide levels 300 times higher than baseline measurements. Carbon monoxide is known to cause heart attacks. And so the just with just the carbon monoxide that's being released, they can expect an increase in the number of people that are being uh, admitted to hospitals and, ex- and experiencing heart attacks, dying from heart attacks following the Hajj. Um, they also have found elevated levels of benzene, black carbon, and other fine particulates that can affect lung function. And there are anecdotal stories of people going, elderly people in the family and individuals coming back from the Hajj with racking coughs hacking coughs that uh, did not let up for weeks after Hmm. having visited Mecca. So, if you want to go to Mecca during the holy days, consider taking a respirator. A little air filtering face mask might be a good idea until they actually put some regulations into play to protect people from the, the air pollution. I, although I do have a feeling that this warning is in some ways lost on our particular audience. Possibly. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, maybe not. I mean, it's, I don't know. it's, it's, it's important to know. Also because I think it's important to talk about because we need regulations everywhere. The Earth is not a closed system. So whatever's happening over in Mecca, that's still entering our airstream and our atmosphere, and it's still... It's part of everything, even though it's really bad there, and and that's a bummer that that still exists. There are still places on this planet you have to... There's a place that you go that the air is so horrible, you have to wear a respirator? That's upsetting. We need to fix that. That's a human rights issue. Mm. That's a bunch of issues just besides us making the Earth healthy. So If it is a cult, you know, it's a cultural... It's important culturally to a large number of people around the world. And so if it is so important, there should be something to make it okay so that those people don't risk their risk their health, risk their lives by going. And for people who just live in the city, additionally, to you know have their health impacted by everybody coming in with their cars. And in Saudi Arabia, everybody has cars. Everybody has cars. And there's no public transportation. There's a very, very little public transportation there. So it's um, it's well, just it's just a it's a well, different but, but they it's, do it's have, a different mindset. They do have a solution. They do have one solution, Kiki, that yeah. that perhaps we could think of enacting here. Uh-huh. Uh huh. because you say that every everybody has a car. Well actually only half of the population is allowed to drive those cars. That's true. So so maybe they're they're cutting their emissions in half simply by not allowing half of the population to drive. 
Thank you for your insightful wisdom, Justin. I'm saying there's bigger... I'm saying when you're talking about... I'm sorry. When I'm talking about this region of the world, there's bigger fish to fry. So that's sure. partly why I'm, I'm mentioning this as a human rights issue because mm -hmm. there's... In America, there's people trying to bring to court that it, there is a human right to clean air. And that's something that I, I kind of hope it catches on. I think it's something that we need to keep in mind that by, by not being responsible and not setting these regulations, you're violating people's rights to breathe health, healthy air, clean and air. And it is something interesting to have scientific uh, data looking at different cities around the world where there is very little regulation on the automotive industry, on emissions into the atmosphere, versus places where we actually do regulate. And we can say that free market in s economy in some issues is not the way it should work because it doesn't work, mm -hmm. as it obviously is not working there. And here we have much better air, and we have regulations right. to protect us. <clears throat> but, but again, this, I'm gonna I'm gonna harp on this one last time. They're gonna move on. <laughs> anytime, anytime when you elevate the rights of women uh, in a society, you get all of those other benefits that come with it, which is a population that wants healthy air for children. That's that's focused on pregnant women yeah. not breathing that stuff. You know, when you elevate the rights of women within any society, your laws get more protective, your 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 um, your society becomes just, less likely to go to war. There's a whole myriad of things that come with it. Uh, yeah. Education levels rise, productivity rise, everything rises with that one single issue of women's rights. Until that is the thing that we're willing as a society or as a nation or as a global uh, you know whether it's the UN or any body that's that's passing or pushing for human rights in the world, and unless that's addressed, nothing else even matters. Nothing else can be changed. I will agree with that. I can agree with that. Um, moving on from unhealthy Hajj, how about arsenic around the world? Did you know that there is a global mass poisoning of millions of people that is ongoing currently? What? Arsenic. Oh, 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 I think I know what this is about. Arsenic in well water. Um, it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> no, it's not. Arsenic is known to, uh, to stunt neural development in children. It causes a myriad of health problems. And um, researchers looking at, um, at the subcontinent of Asia in India specifically have been testing uh, field test kits that they've been developing, special test kits to test water for arsenic. They found though that um, generally in the areas they have they have been looking, when people find out that they have arsenic in their wells, only about a third of the people switch wells to improve the water that they have. Hmm. Fifty percent of people in the areas that they've looked at in India, 50% are affected by arsenic-contaminated water. 100% of those people are within walking distance to an uncontaminated well. Only a third of the people actually change their situation. So there's a, there's, it's implied that there is finan that there is a financial aspect to this and there is financial inequality that's making it difficult. It's more expensive to dig deep wells. Mm -hmm. In the area in Bangladesh and Bihar, India, uh, where they tested it along the, uh, the Ganges River Valley, the River Delta, arsenic has been laid down sediment in, sediment or sediment in sediments over arsenic with arsenic containing waters from the rivers over tens of thousands of years and those arsenic sediments are in the top 100 meters of the soil if you dig down to older earth past 100 meters you get arsenic free water and so people necessarily are gonna have to pay more money to be able to get to the arsenic free water 
So let me throw one thing out there that's just just occurring to me in this story. Okay. What's the what's the last sort of major plague you've heard of coming out of India? Whether it's a swine or a pig or I mean a swine or a bird flu or an Ebola or an anything else. I can't think of one. This is a this is a densely populated, impoverished area with in many areas, it's, it's just renowned for having substandard uh, conditions for... Infrastructure. There's limited infrastructure. Yes. Right. Thank you for finding a, a clean way of saying this. Arsenic has, in well water, especially in your water, even above the elevated levels, has a reaction to the immune system that keeps the immune system heightened. It makes the immune system... And it, it keeps it in a constant state of being ready to fight as it's being poisoned. This is one of the things that they attributed to uh, so many people having contracted what was it, the swine flu in Mexico mm -hmm. and surviving with it is, was the fact that there was arsenic in the well water where in the epicenter of the outbreak. And the fact that people didn't just die off from it but we're actually uh, sort of not immune to it so much, but we're able to fight off, survive through the stages and not die. Yeah, um, so the, the issue here is that um, it's a, it's a dose-dependent effect, and so it's low levels of arsenic. So if it's just like very low levels of arsenic above that you're being exposed to, above recommended. So 10 micrograms per liter is what is recommended for drinking water. Less than 10 micrograms per liter is what's recommended. Below 50 micrograms, between 10 and 50, is like low dose where you will probably get those enhanced immune effects. Um, but a lot of the wells that they're talking about in India are much, much more contaminated and people are getting massive poisoning um, from, from arsenic. So there's just, there's a, there's a big thing going on with that. And additionally, with the arsenic issue, this is something that it, because it's densely popul populated in this part of the world, in India, it's a, it's a huge, huge issue. But it's a global issue. Throughout the United States, there are, uh, there's a lot of arsenic in the groundwater. And if you are on a well, it is very likely that there is arsenic in your well water. Hmm. And it is, um, there are some places that are more likely than others. Uh, the USGS has been doing a survey I think 2011 was the last year that they closed their map of their survey. Um, but they have, they have maps, they have data on areas that are very high arsenic concentrations and very low arsenic concentrations. And if you are on well water, I behoove you to call your local water, um, water de department to be able to find out where the nearest testing facility is to find Wait, out. If you were on well somebody, water... Isn't there a good chance you don't have a water department? No, there isn't. There's a local, uh, like the closest the city management. Yeah, somewhere yeah. in the county. You can. There's a. There's a. There are uh, state officials who have been who are in charge of regional areas, and okay. so you can call them, and they'll tell you what the closest laboratory is, and somebody can come out and test your water. There are test kits available online. I do not know how good those test kits are, so. Um, Laboratory testing, while more expensive, may be more accurate at that. So it's not just India, it's worldwide, and it's estimated that there are some 4 million people drinking more arsenic than is recommended. Not great. Not great. Arsenic, not great. And then the other kind of not great but interesting study is that they're looking at cholera from space. <laughs> Why am I laughing? I don't know why I'm laughing at cholera. It's because you add in space to anything and it's like, whoa, wait, cholera, what? In so, space, cholera in space. How I was going to do that and I decided it was important. It makes no sense. Um, they're looking, yeah, from space. So they are using, researchers are using satellites to track um, temperature and precipitation and create a predictive model for cholera act outbreaks. Cholera is a bacteria that is naturally occurring in, uh, in the water, and very often it, it um, vibrio cholera, it exists in uh, coastal areas. It, the cholera that we know that is 
dangerous and disease causing in humans got its start in India and it has the largest effect currently in India up the rivers as a result of um, low river flow out of the rivers ocean water can seep in and bring bacteria into the rivers and then once that happens then there's more cholera there and there's not good water sanitation and so people get cholera and then after the monsoons there's flooding and so these areas that have had these high like little reservoirs or pockets of cholera in the water those get shifted to maybe previously clean pockets of water and so then they have like another uh, peak in the cholera season. So they have two cholera seasons in India. Cholera has spread to just about every continent. It has spread to every continent around the globe. Um, United States, we have great municipal water sanitation and health, so we do not experience outbreaks the way the rest of the world does. Currently, Africa is um, experiencing an outbreak, and the predictive models that these people came up with uh, suggests that by 2050 the entire central region of Africa will be experiencing regular cholera outbreaks based on climate models of expected temperature and precipitation. So yay climate, shifting cholera, more cholera everywhere. But they used satellites to figure this out. That's nice. Good for them. Good for them, yay! I have other happy news, but um, I'll let somebody else tell a story before I get to those. Does anyone else have anything to talk about? Happy? Oh, uh, the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs? Mm -hmm. Nearly killed us, too. Yeah. Yeah, this is a... Uh, it's not really... We, we, we sort of have this picture like dinosaurs ended, and then the vacuum, uh, the mammals rose up because we loved... We love the good asteroid strike. No, we were hiding. We were little shrew creatures hiding underground. Right. Yeah, but going back, the, this is uh, they're they're looking at the actual the the many 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 species of mammals that they now know lived at the same time as the dinosaurs, and ninety we lot we nearly got wiped out too basically. There there were there were many many mammals. Actually, the mammals that managed to survive were the live birth uh, to well-developed young, young that could sort of get up and go, like day one. The, the metatherians or whatever they were. The, yes, uh, the, older, the, old, mm -hmm. the older version. The, yeah. Uh, the, oh, the metatherians? Metatherians. Yeah. I, I, I guess weren't. They, were the, they weren't um, live birth ready to go. They might have been agri marsupial pouch hang on to this sort yep. of, mm -hmm. you know, they're unable to... Those are marsupials, basically, metatheria. Yeah, yeah, uh, which is why they're so young. There's so few of them, right? Right, and they were, they would have been a much larger representation, actually, of, of mammals, uh, had it not been for the extinction. Uh, I really, really wish that we could have hung out with the marsupial, saber-toothed, cat-like animal. <laughs> That would have been cool. But I guess that explains why there's even less of the prototheria, which is the egg-laying mammals. Yeah. Any, so it looks, sounds like anything that had to stay in one place uh, and watch for, you know, watch out for its young too much uh, didn't really make it. Run, baby, run! Get up and go. We're That's living great. in a post-asteroid Earth. I think the this the good side to this story is not that we were almost wiped out, but woohoo! We made it this far. We survived. That's good. Yeah. Um, related to dinosaurs, I have something related to dinosaurs. Um, you know how we're always joking about how chickens look like tiny T Rexes. That's because yeah. there are T Rex. It's most closely related to a chicken of anything on the planet, right? Yeah, chickens and turkeys are the closest related to dinosaur ancestors of all of the birds, and they found that out by looking at um, their genome and their chromosome pattern, um, and they had a signature that was m the most similar 
to the feathered dinosaurs than to the other birds. Kiki, what are you uh, what are you sharing there? I am sharing an image search for chicken dinosaurs. <laughs> 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 so I'm currently screen sharing images from Google Image Search, a big old page of beautiful images. Some of them are bird-like dinosaurs, and some of them are artists' representations of chickens as dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what they have in common is something called microchromosomes, which cool. birds have and we don't, and, uh, or birds, sorry, birds have the most of any other bird group. We have some we don't have nearly as many microchromosomes as birds do, and the microchromosomes, you can find them in common with the chickens and the feathered dinosaurs, so. Also, yeah, Aww. chickens have teeth uh, embryotically, uh -huh. and they start to form, and then they cease forming. Uh, and, and as well as I always kind of, I, I took, I did this once where I had the chicken clucks, the sound of chicken clucks, and I went into an audio editor. Any you could use any sort of audio editing device that you can find on a computer, and I slow, I pitch shifted it down and drew it out to be longer. And the chicken's cluck, if you were to size up the creature, sounds menacingly enough like a what you would expect a dinosaur roar to be. <laughs> I would like, however, uh, the next Thanks. Jurassic Park to show that sort of chicken motion as a T-Rex walks. Instead of the big clumping, just sort of the... I can't. I'm doing the chicken. The neck. The there. neck so movement forward. Audio, like a chicken dance. Walk like a chicken. Right? Like <laughs> and uh, oh, Kiki, you'll like this. The bird of all the birds that they looked at that was the least like dinosaurs that showed the quote fastest rate of change, mm -hmm. meaning the most different genome, was. Can you guess? Zebrafinch! Zebrafinch! Yay! Wow. Fastest rate of change. Yeah. Your buddy the zebrafinch. That's interesting. Very interesting. Dynamic hey, what's more important uh, for getting good grades in school? That winning personality <laughs> or intelligence? Personality. It has to be personality. Right? It is. Yeah, it's annoying. Um... <laughs> 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 having <laughs> having been through school with the I don't give a bleep personality, uh, but I thought plenty of intelligence. This is uh, Dr. Probot says educational institutions need to focus less upon intelligence, instead pay more attention to a student's personality. He's going the wrong direction. With respect to learning, personality is more useful than intelligence for guiding both students and teachers. In practical terms, the amount of effort students are prepared to put in and where that effort is focused is at least as important as whether the students are smart. And a student with the most helpful personality will score a full grade higher than an average student in this regard. In, this, uh, in Dr. Probat's research, students' assessment of their own personality is as useful for, uh, useful for, is as useful for predicting university success as intelligence rankings. However, when people who know the student well provide a personality rating, it is nearly four times more accurate for predicting grades. Dr. Propat says, understanding how personality impacts on academic achievement is a vi is vital, is a vital uh, when it comes to helping students reach future success. Intelligence tests have always been closely linked with education and grades and therefore relied upon to predict who would do well. The impact of personality on study is genuinely surprising for educational researchers and for anyone who thinks they did well at school because they are smart. Previous studies have shown that students who think they are smart often stop trying and their performance declines over time, while those who consider themselves hard workers get progressively better. Personality does change, and some educators have trained aspects of students' consciousness and openness, leading to greater learning capacity. By contrast, there is little evidence that intelligence can be taught, despite the popularity of brain training apps. Yeah. Perscapacity? Pers 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 how do you say that word? Yeah. Um, 
I don't like that. This. What, what were the grades of these students that they were talking about? I heard you mentioned university later on. Yeah, no, it does not it does not say in what I'm reading. Because here's here's what I'm thinking. Primary school. Right. I would say K through eight, maybe even K through twelve, is just as much about socialization and language skills and communication skills as it is about learning a subject. And so I'm not surprised at all that a social person and a person with skills in communication and that comes across often as things like charisma and a good attitude, that person is also going to do well in school because that's a lot of what you're testing. And that's a lot of also what you're trying to build. And, and here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, Blair. It's not necessarily charisma as being charismatic. Um, it's personality traits. So it's that it's the teacher's pet, it's the helpful, it's going to try really hard on their homework personality, perhaps. Because I have to tell you, and this is just an ad hoc uh, observation on my part, but some of the most charismatic and truly intelligent people I knew growing up were really bad at school. It depends on well how you're people. defining people charisma, who, though. People who and were actively <laughs> reading books outside of assigned schoolwork were terrible at the assigned schoolwork because it was just, you know. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot though now. There's now teaching parents, trying to get parents to do things like not say, oh, great job, that's so awesome, and rewarding the thing that was created, but to say, wow, you worked so hard on that instead, yeah. so that you train kids into thinking more about hard work and persevering and stick to itiveness and you know that they would maybe become the type of person more likely to become the type of person that doesn't rest on their laurels you know, I'm smart I got this and then stop trying then what's the point of being intelligent if you don't it's like about how you use it go right to the result and then get to rest on your laurels for a while that's the whole point how are you using that intelligence if your goal is to be good in school and to get good grades and to go far in the academic system it doesn't you need to be smart, but you also need to be communicative. You need to have language skills. You need to be diplomatic at times. You need to know when to be quiet. There are all of these things that are part of being in a school system that are not directly related to smarts. To intelligence at all. Oh. But you know what else isn't related to smarts? What? How much you enjoy the holidays. <laughs> Not related I would venture to say all. no, it's not related. So I have a couple of holiday-related stories that are super fun. Uh, the Chemical and Engineering News website has a super great article written by Carmen Drawl um, about tinsel, the science of tinsel. Tinsel used to be made of lead. Did you know that? <laughs> Once I'm upon surprised. a time, it was made of lead. And... It was only 1972 that the FDA kind of started to get rid of it. But they didn't tell everybody that they were going to get rid of it. You know how, they, how uh, the government has said, we're going to get rid of all standard incandescent light bulbs, and people have started stockpiling light bulbs all over the place? Mm -hmm. right. Well, they were afraid that people were going to stockpile this lead-based tinsel, we and so they smarter. didn't publicize, publicize it, and they just shifted it over. And, and just, they stopped making it that way, and now it's just made of plastic. Polyvinyl chloride is one of the ways, one of the plastic poly polymers that it's made out of, um, and it sh shines and it sparkles, and there's a really neat article all about it, but wouldn't you know, it used to be made of tin, lead, Mm. There's also silver and gold tinsel, but that's pretty flammable, so they don't really sell that either. <laughs> Super fun stuff. And then NASA is looking at us over the holidays. They've been using uh, their one of their satellites to take pictures of the world. So you remember two years ago, the Earth at Night came out. There was the black marble, marble image, which is the picture of the Earth with all of the lights that come from humanity all around the globe. There's an animated GIF that like it spins around, and you can see 
the lights. From every major the lights country, from space. Yeah, from everywhere. Up except for North Korea. Exactly. Exactly. So the, they were able to get a, kind of some, some basic information from that. But these researchers were like, well, what if we could make it more dynamic? That image was a composite where they took all the best images over several months, but there was really no timing based on them. And then they stacked them all up together to get a nice bright image that we could see. And so these researchers, what they did is they took a picture late at night all every day of the year. And so they've got three years worth of data and they've been compiling it to look at patterns, like getting activity patterns of people from light use. And so they're actually able to see light intensity increase during certain periods of the year. They specifically highlighted the holiday season versus the rest of the year and found that Every major metropolitan area in the United States increases in its light output substantially over the holidays. Interestingly, though, the lights, the, the brightness and the illumination increases the most in the suburbs and not in the centers of cities. So what they think is happening is people are leaving work early and they are going home and they're turning on their Christmas lights. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, so there's just some really neat information that they're, you know, getting and that we can see our activity patterns, our, what we're doing and what's culturally important in certain areas of the world um, at different times of the year. And they do, they've also looked at some other areas of the year. Um, they looked at Puerto Rico, and they looked at the Middle East. They got some really interesting information out of this um, one of the things that they, they saw, they saw a, as opposed to a positive change, a positive signal um, in Iraq and also in, um, in Egypt, in Syria, um, areas that were messed up because their power grid was messed up because of military conflicts, um, they saw a negative effect. And so part of the algorithm that they've been using to get the light from the cities to actually be able to get these pictures that they have now, um, part, of the, uh, part of the algorithm subtracts out moonlight. It, it, it huh. subtracts out reflected light. And so if you get rid of all the light in an area, what's the only light that's left at night to illuminate? Moonlight. And so if you subtract out the moonlight with, uh, from the signal with math, all of a sudden you get negative. Yes. You get a negative result. And so they were like, oh, that means there's just nothing, nothing there. And so they were seeing even during important periods of time like Ramadan that there were certain areas that just they were not increasing and they actually had negative results. Hmm. Negative light. I don't even know what that would look like. <laughs> Negative light, yeah. Just so, just infinite darkness. Yeah. <laughs> well, just darker than it was in the past, right? It's co correlating it, comparing it yeah. to past and present, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. Co it's averaging over time, so. and it's an intensity measure where you have, um, you know, the way that they're, that they're putting, I'll, um, I'll share this image up on the screen right now, and I'll describe it to those of you who are still listening via audio. Um, you get an impression of intensity based on color. And so what they have done in their, their visualization of this data is they are, showing, um, they are showing kind of yellow as the standard average where there's no change. Green spots are increasing, and then red areas are decreasing, and there's less light. And so in areas... In the holidays, currently, what we're seeing is a lot of green shifting from the urban centers out to the suburbs, whereas someplace like during Ramadan, in an area where there's uh, been a military conflict or something, um, instead of the lights increasing and you seeing a, a nice green spot on the map, you would see a red spot. And so you would, that's how it would be visualized to you. But they also looked at it graphically um, and were able to see, um, you know, on a graph, changes in light intensity 
day by day. And so they had kind of a sign, a, a curve where it would go up and down and up and down and up and down. And in places where there's more light being used, it would increase along the y-axis, up the y-axis. And in areas where there's left, it, uh, where there's less light, it would be a, a negative decrease. So deflection. But anyway, holiday lights seen from space. We are uh, starting to look at ourselves and our behaviors from space. And one of the first ways that we did see our behaviors change because of Christmas lights, which is pretty cool. Festive. Very festive. Absolutely. So everybody, these holidays, why don't you go roast yourself a dino chicken and enjoy nice plastic glittery silvery tinsel and the Christmas lights illuminating your suburban neighborhood. <laughs> Before we go, I do want to give an ant update because I looked into it. <laughs> yes. Since we were talking about it before. So the type of ants that they saw eating the, the a larva were eating the eggs was a group of wood ants. And wood ants have um, multiple queens and they will often be po poly, poly Polydomus, gosh, I can't speak right now, which ha means they, the, the hives have multiple nests, and the queens can have multiple nests, and the queens also can be singly or multiply mated. So it sounds to me like either you're a helper female or you're a queen. Either way, your genetic material is getting helped, either directly or indirectly. If you're a male, there's an opportunity to mate with a queen because they can have multiple mates, but you could also lose out on that opportunity. And that's why it seems to me not too surprising that they might try to cut their um, competition. Nice. Interesting. Thanks for that return to the subject. Thanks for bringing I us back to that. I in know. case anyone was dying to know. <laughs> I was interested. I, was. I just forgot. I, <laughs> I forgot to come back to it. All right, everybody, this is that time in the show where we thank our Patreon sponsors. I'd like to thank Kevin, Kevin Donald Wesley Ballard, Paul D. Disney, Tucker Chastain, Sam Winsier, John Ratnaswamy, Rudy Garcia, Steve DeBell, Stephen B., Jason Dozier, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, Andreas Oxstad, Jason Roberts, Patrick Cohn, Shane and Tara Ginsberg. Byron Lee, E.O., Bob Calder, Jared Lysette, Ulysses Adkins, Jake Jones, Nicholas Lai, Brian Hedrick, Cassie Letts, Lester, Chris Cross, Sarah Chavis, Stephen Sorowiak, Layla, Paul Stanton, Marshall Clark, Charlene Davidson Henry, Don Kamarechka, Randy Mazuka, Ed Dyer, and Tony Steele. Lord Trentoni and Moody, Larry Garcia, Daryl Lambert, Brian Condren, Richard Bowersox, Kevin Parachan, Dave Major, Brian Rossman, James Dobson, Steve Goodwin, Kurt Stefan, Michael George, Craig Landon, Russell Jensen, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapeau, Darren Lute, Tara Payne, Alex Wilson, John H. Baloney, Jason Olds, James, Paul West, Lauren Lang, Ed Bennett, Thomas Mikanen, Alec Doty, Illuminalama, Nick Gradwell, Dougal Campbell, TMRO, Miko Pakala, Craig Porter, Adam Mishkan, Aaron Luthen, Marjorie Scott Lejewski, Tyler Harrison, Ben Ruthig, Columbo Ahmed, and Gary Swinsburg. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone else who is not named but are also supporters on Patreon and for those of you who support us on PayPal. Thank you so much for your support. If you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Also remember that you can help us out simply by telling your friends about Twist. And I just want to take this moment to say Thank you. Thank you for everything this holiday season, whatever holiday it is you're celebrating or not. Just thank you. On next week's show, we're not going to be here. Hey, we're taking a break. It's Christmas Eve. We're going to take a week off. But we'll be back on December 30th, which is a Tuesday evening for those of you who like for our top 11 of 2014 show, December 30th, Tuesday, December 30th at 8 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. That's Tuesday, December 30th, 8 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. We'll be broadcasting live on twist.org slash live. You can watch and join in the chat room, but don't worry if you can't make it because 
it'll be there on YouTube and also at twist.org. Thank you, everybody, for listening and enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science into your iTunes directory. Or if you have a mobile device, you can look for Twist for Droid app in the Android Marketplace or This Week in Science in the Apple Marketplace and Podcast directory. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. What's our website? It's www.twist.org. That's T-W-I-S dot O-R-G. There you can make comments. You can start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. Or you can hit us up directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in your subject line, or your email will get spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are, at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for some more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. Goes the way. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science is the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop. Got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in. I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. This week in 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 science. This week
week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. Oh yeah. And that concludes our program. We now take you to the post show. Wow. I have a very large pencil. That is a very large pencil. That is a very, very large pencil. Yeah. Incredibly. <laughs> Super yumbo pencil. It's a fancy pencil you got there. It's a super you know, kind of, jumbo pencil. It's for, that's for big work, when you have big work to do. How do you sharpen it that? Works. I don't know. <laughs> I just grabbed it in here. <laughs> that's fine. Skew's here. Post show. Pew, pew, pew. That's right. Wizmike says, now we need to find the mechanism on old earth to change hydrogen to water. I still have a lot of water. I've got a lot of hydrogen. Done. Right, we're working on I that. I worked it out all with this pencil. No. It's right here. I have, I have, I'm writing this week on Boing Boing, so the stories that I talked about tonight, they are... I've written them up. There's more information on in those stories than what was able to be covered here tonight, but I'll do the best I could. But boingboing.net. I've got writing there. I am writing That's for fun. this yeah, American Geophysical Union all week long. I'm writing stories. So it's cool. And I've got some neat stuff. And the story that Justin brought up, I'm going to be talking with the researcher tomorrow nice. about the water in Earth. I'm going to be talking with with her tomorrow. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm so excited about that. I'm very excited about that to talk about water and the earth. And I talked about talked with a guy who went to a cave about methane and hydrogen sulfide and had no idea. Hydrogen sulfide. Sulfuric acid. Right? Sulfuric mm -hmm. acid. Mm -hmm. Sulfuric acid is a very strong acid. It is indeed. It your skin. completely underneath the earth in limestone deposits, if sulfuric acid seeps into them, it eats them away. And so the car, like many caves, limestone caves in our earth are the result of hydrogen sulfide, of the sulfuric acid eating away the limestone, just dissolving it. Gone. Hmm. So interesting to me. So I've always wondered, where did these caves come from? Well, sometimes it's because they were dissolved. The earth was dissolved away. The rock was just dissolved. It's like away. when you're when you're so hungry that you feel like your stomach's going to eat itself. That's what was happening to the earth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> when your stomach. stomach yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So. Interesting. That just made me. Oh yeah. And then I'm gonna. I haven't written this one up yet either. Um, I have to write up my. I, I ran across a young Earth creationist poster today. The guy wasn't young. He was very old, and he was not able to tell me anything. He was like the worst presenter ever. I was like, so give me the take-home message. Young. Yeah, I'm like, what are the bullet points? And then he just was like, stammer, stammer, blah, 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 blah. I don't even know what my research is. Blah, 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 blah. And as he's doing that, I'm like looking over his shoulder and scanning through the poster for information. The only thing that brought me over there in the first place was like dinosaur bones. I saw dinosaur bo bones in the title, and I'm like, oh, that sounds interesting. One of the few words I actually understand here at this conference. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> So I like, you know, got over there like, as I'm scanning through it. All of a sudden, I realized that what they're trying to do is discredit carbon carbon fourteen dating, and imply oh, that humans, no. Neanderthals, and dinosaurs lived at the same time, and that since geologists are two thousand years off, or two thousand times multiplication factor off on their estimate of the age of dinosaurs, and therefore the age of the Earth. 
their estimate of the size of the universe is completely wrong also. So we need to be really worried about asteroids hitting us more often because there's probably a lot more close in than what we thought. This was like... All this stuff in this poster, and I just was like, how do I get away from this stammering, yammering man? Oh, no. I wish I was there. I was so glad that somebody interrupted. I was like... Do you, under, do you not understand what a beautiful scene I would have created? <laughs> yeah, oh my god, no, you would have body slammed it. If, I'd, if I had, like, gotten it right then, like, I had to, like, go think about it some more, and then I was just like, I was like, okay, what is wrong with the science that they're doing? And I was like, that's what I was like, I'm like, how did it get in, how did it pass the test, the, ab, the test of the abstract to get into the conference? Ah... How did it end up there? How did they end up being able to present that work? I bet somebody been, just wanted to appear to be objective. Maybe. Could it have been like uh, like an ugly date contest or something? <laughs> yeah. Could it have been... I mean, the thing about the carbon-14 the carbon 14 dating, the thing about it that is like... It, it, because of the way that carbon-14, the half-life of, of carbon-14, it is not accurate. It becomes inaccurate after about 40,000 years. So we can only use carbon-14 dating back for about 40,000 years maximum. After that point in time, we have to use other radiometric dating techniques. So even trying to consider using carbon-14 dating to look at dinosaur bones, fossils that are in geologic strata estimated to be millions of years old. But, but, but Kirsten, you, you don't bring a science textbook uh, to a knife fight. I know. Okay? I okay. know so that. I'm just saying. What you have to take on is you have to take this on in a different, in a different tact. Mm -hmm. Question one. Were the dinosaurs on Noah's Ark? <laughs> no, they didn't make it. That's why they're gone. Were they because they didn't fit? That they were drowned in the flood? What? What? How come there were the dinosaurs on Noah's Ark? Just first question. No, no they didn't make it. Okay. Second, so just, just like the unicorns. The unicorns yeah. didn't didn't make it either. The Earth is flooded. And the mermaids. <laughs> Does mermaids. that mean? All of the plants on the planet were recreated uh, after the flood because obviously all of the plant life on the planet died after having been submersed in, in water. Right? Yeah. We would, ha we would be living on a desert planet. That is an interesting point. Spores on the sheeps? I don't know. Yeah, stuck in the sh in the in the wool. Was of the there a sheep. seed bank? Mm. Two by two of every seed. <laughs> I mean, there's there's problems. Awesome. There's there's bigger problems. There's a lot of work to be done. With if it were a global flood, yeah. Without having to defend anything scientifically. <laughs> I I can care less. Fine, you know you can. We can get rid of every... Just forget just for the moment. Suspend all belief or disbelief in science for the moment. How do you suppose that things came about? This is where, this is where the argument really becomes entertaining. This is, this, is, this is when the fun can really be had. A, a, a planet without plants, one of every dinosaur... Are you drinking out of a red cup in your own house? Uh, yeah. It's a <laughs> This is actually the only... I have to derail this question. <laughs> this conversation, this is, only, this is only... Distract a cup? What? This is a college town. This is the only sort of cup you are able to buy or purchase in this town. This is the only one they even make. You have to leave town to find any sort of container... Please, Davis, don't party that hard. That isn't a red cup. Goodness. Goodness gracious. Oh, well. So I'm, gonna, 
I gotta buy our tickets. I'm gonna buy our tickets this week. The next couple of days, I'm gonna buy our tickets to New York City. Okay. New York City. Fuck hotels. What do you need for me? Stuff. My driver's license number. Should I give it out over the internet right now? That's yeah, good idea, and right? your social security yeah. number and everything. Yeah, no, do you want no, that no. too? Don't, don't how about my, my how about my bank account? Don't yeah, say it. Yeah, do that too. To okay. All right. Just hold it up to the camera. Nobody just Okay. Fine. Yeah. All right. No. <laughs> yeah, I'll text you guys or email you or something and be like, I need this information from you. I think yeah, I'm not sure. I know I'm going to need your middle names and date of birth for sure. If you if so. you know what um, airline you end up going with, a couple of them have my information stored. Cool. And okay. any know. airline that you uh, put my name forth, uh, I'm already on a list that they will recognize. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the no-fly list. <laughs> One one time, one time I get a little anxious on a plane. One time. One time I ask them to land at a different destination because I've taken the wrong flight or changed my mind mid-flight about where I wanted to land. One time I demanded a little uh, extra courtesy from an airline. One time, and uh, I took a one-way flight to the Middle East. Oh. Dun, 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 dun. So, what do you think kind of list I'm on? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Oh, honey. Well, I just hope I just hope I can get my 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 uh, lead apron through uh, <laughs> to the checkpoint yeah. onto the plane, so as to avoid all the unnecessary X-rays in case of lightning strikes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they always just go through my bag. They go, what's this? What's this? What's this? And I'm like, well, those are socks. Huh? That's a book. <laughs> That's pretty much how it goes. So it just takes me about 20 minutes longer to get through security than the average person. <laughs> Oy. Uh, look what I just found. Russia is launching from Baikonur. Is launching a spy satellite for South Africa. The South Af the South African military are launching their first spy satellite. That's interesting. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. It's cute how the rest of the world wants to play in. <laughs> The balance of power. And... I'm gonna have one satellite. Uh huh. <laughs> cute. That's cute. I think yeah, good for them. Now, now. Well, and I, and there's some level too. I'm appreciating. It's like I don't know if I'm completely aghast and outraged that uh, a horrible movie is being uh, taken out of theaters because of fear of reprisal from North Korea? Or if I really love the fact that North Korea's chosen enemy, what it sees as the global threat, is, is a comedy a movie. is <laughs> a horrible, awful movie with lots of college humor. Like, that's their... They're focusing their, their national security efforts on preventing this movie. Hang on. Did they pull it out of the theaters? I didn't think yeah, so. Yeah, they canceled the uh, opening. Was it called The Interview? The yeah. Interview is mm -hmm. being scrapped. Mm -hmm. Oh, in North Korea. No, here. Yeah, they're not showing it here either. No, they don't show any movie. They're well, well, like, yeah, no, they're going to pull it here because, okay. So, so what, they're gonna movie, do it. They're gonna go straight to video. You think, or they won't do it at all? They might not even do the video. They're like, <gasps> well, right now everything is off the table on this movie. Um, part of it is that's pretty because silly. there have been threats that there would be violence in theaters if if it went out. But also the Sony hacking scandal that took place yeah. has been mm -hmm. routed back to North Korea. I was just 
the people are wondering though whether the evidence is enough to really say that it's North Korea or whether it was another hacking group. Well, no, regardless, regardless, I love the idea that North Korea sees the largest threat to its national security as being a Seth Rogen movie. Right? <laughs> James Franco! <laughs> this is really it? how delicate. Have you seen Newt, Newt Gingrich's tweets? Newt Gingrich has been saying that this is like a full on act of war. Um, I, I it's a, know. It's a not just a terrorist attack, it is an, atta it is a, an act of war. That's what Newt, Newt Gingrich is, yeah. is saying. Well, um, I mean, he always wants to go to war. And, right. and I don't know that I don't. I'm I'm actually really. Uh, I wish we weren't pulling this movie. I think the movie itself is going to be. I think maybe Seth Rogen's pulling this movie. Honestly, like I don't even his stand. This movie might be might be so bad that he's like, even by my standards, even by the fact that my audience who's watching this is mostly going to be stoned while viewing this. They still might reject it. It might be that bad of a movie. <laughs> but, Maybe it was just a really bad movie. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He's him and, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Franco. James I mean, Franco. James Franco is not a good actor, so. Hired by the CIA, co opted by the CIA to, you know, kill the leader. So, <laughs> I can't. If there was a movie. That was about going to America and killing the president. I could see the United States being, you know, that's really not a great topic for a movie. It does seem like it was not a choice. Like, I understand why they did it, and I think it's, you know, it is kind of funny as a premise, but... It's a joke movie. It's James Franco and... What's his name? Yeah. Seth Rogen. It's a joke yeah. movie. They're, it's going to be comedy. But yeah, I understand but, but you also have to understand funny. that if, if it was the, going the other way, we would be outraged, even if it was a comedy. Yeah, right. It would be kind of outrageous if it was a comedy coming the other way. But the other thing I think we need to understand is that the North Korean people wouldn't know the difference between something. There have been on the news with videotape, with, with footage of troops and explosions of North Korea invading and taking territory from the United States. <laughs> you understand? Like, they've been winning a world war that the rest of the planet hasn't experienced in any way, shape, or form, and it's being reported on their news. Their separation between what they see on the television and what they're told to admit or say or state or believe, whatever, there is no separation. I wonder this if this is, is also is this, propaganda, this, and if the esteemed leader can't prevent something like this, then I'm wondering though if this no Sony, if Sony pulling it, Sony pulling it. it, yeah. But I'm wondering if that's a publicity stunt for Sony. Like if mm. you know, you pull it, and all of I mean, I hadn't heard of this movie before. All of this, all of a sudden, I'm like, what's the interview? What's the interview? Oh my gosh, what a perfect publicity stunt. Mm. You pull it, and you get tons of tons of people wanting to see it. No, no, we're not going to release it. We're not going to release it. Oh, we'll release it. And they start releasing it at, like, a few theaters. and that, Or they, like, you know, do just make it so that everybody wants it. I don't know. Is this something that's like the, um, the cartoons? So the Danish cartoon artist who um, drew a picture of the... It was Mohammed, right? Mohammed, yeah. yeah. Drew a picture of Mohammed, a cartoon image, and that's not okay in the Muslim faith. So, you know, there were death threats against that cartoonist. You know, the newspapers pulled the right. cartoon. There were, you know, they didn't publish it because it was such a cultural thing. Is this that? I don't see. I mean, are we that on that? Are we on tender hooks? Tinder hooks, Tinder hooks with North Korea so much so that this movie needs to be pulled. I don't think so. Uh, I don't know. 
Well, okay, so here's here's the thing, and then you all, there's also with Salman Rushdie, you know, there's there's uh, and and the world capitulates a little bit on each of these, and and part of the reason why the Danish cartoon wasn't re-shown and all of the coverage about it and all the discussion about it in the U.S. media, they didn't re-show the cartoon, which if you haven't seen it. It's a guy with a beard and a turban that has a bomb hidden in the turban. That's all it is. To, well, to our right. mind, to our mind, it's not necessarily it's nothing. It's not right. much, but he, it's he, to a believer, it is a lot. Right. So, he could have been so standing so there without a bomb in his turban, and it still would have been controversial because you're not supposed to have a visual depiction of Muhammad. I think right. that was the bottom line that got people so upset: is that you're not supposed to have anything, whether it's flattering or not, no visual depiction of Mohammed is acceptable. Right. <laughs> so, for anybody else who is not a part of the faith either, I mean, I get it if in your own faith you're not going to create depictions, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. The reason uh, the U.S. media largely gave for not re Publishing. showing this mm -hmm. image is the fear that is the the fear that it would cause unstable elements to act violently and North Korea is an unstable rogue nation element with a a and it's hard to explain this it's not just a dictatorship it is because the the actual it's the president of North Korea uh, is not the Kim Jong Il, it's not even his father. It's his father. It's Kim Jong Il's father, not the what's his name, the kid now. When, yeah. But the two generations back, dead man, the grandfather, the dead grandfather is still the president of the country. Mm -hmm. He has not been displaced. This he was he was a he was a um, he was ascended to heaven upon his death. In fact. And is a deity, in fact, within that nation. So you're talking about a religion worked into a dictatorship, worked into a propaganda machine that doesn't end. Big brother be damned. This has gone to the next step and is a religiocracy. Right? So, yeah. Very, very unstable. But admitting that these things are unstable, doesn't that just require us in some level to take some sort of action? I mean, shouldn't we all be wearing Mohammed t-shirts and and uh, playing the interview every night at midnight until the rest of the... until whoever we're provoking either decides, you know what... They're, it's, it's not worth it. <laughs> Leave worth them it. alone. Just yeah. ignore them. Because there were people, there were there were people killed. There was rioting. There was all sorts of things over a cartoon. You know, uh, this is this is the biggest challenge to the free world, really. It's like we have to capitulate yeah. to an unfree world. The whole yeah. point of being the free world is stop capitulating to nonsense. This is our. This is what it is. This is it's why we it. have a free speech. So what it country. is? This is why this nation was founded. Yeah. What stop. it is is that we've got. You know, hackers who are threatening attacks on movie theaters that show the film. Movie theater chains are like, I'm not going to show that. We don't want to have ourselves. We don't want BOMBs on, in, our, in our theaters. We don't want people to get injured. We don't want that to happen. That's not good for our bottom line. You know, the, the theaters are saying that. And so the theaters themselves just say, you know, it's Sony. Never mind, we don't need to show it. And then Sony goes, oh, well, nobody wants to show it, so we'll pull it. But who knows? Maybe, maybe, I mean, why not release it online? Just put it out there. It would probably be, like, the biggest online release ever. And maybe uh, it could set a standard for online movie releases. That which saw, would be really uh, cool for media. For the uh, Christopher Hitchens quote, necrocracy. Necrocracy. Necrocracy? Necrocracy. It's a necrocracy over there. Uh, yeah. We're already dead. Yeah. Ruled by the dead. Mm -hmm, mm 
Uh, so fascinating. This is a very Muhammad interesting place. Building? Really? Ooh. There is a there is a point though for the conversation where. Ooh, to get along, there is respect for faiths mm -hmm. and cultures and ideals. And as we become a more integrated global community, will it be harder for individual cultures to be able to hold on to things like, you know, the the deification of a ruler in particular that, you know, they're like, ah, we're going to hurt you if you do this, whatever, or the, um, you know, imagery of a of a prophet that, that they believe in. Um, you know, will it be that everybody becomes really politically correct and every, and we just are really just quiet about things and never talk about them as we become a more integrated community? Or will it be that we will continue to be fractious and divided yeah. on these accounts? Like, it's, there's... There's a certain amount of respect, but there's also a good for these individual ideas, these mm -hmm. cultural ideas to be maintained. Like there's, we're gonna have to let it go at some point that other cultures don't believe the same way. And so, if it's somebody from another culture saying something, yeah. just, I don't know. It's uh, if you look at America, right? There's we do all sorts of satires of the president and Congress and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. In mainstream music, well not just South Park, South Park is kind of fringe, but like all over we do satires that are targeting the president or Congress or what have you. So I think that if the community becomes global as it look, looks like it's going to be and there really is this sense of world instead of a sense of country that mm -hmm. if anything I would say there will be more. There will be more satire, and it will be allowed. But I, I think so. this is different. <laughs> so. This is different because you can't just waltz into North Korea as anybody. Nope. And that's I think what makes this so different is that you or I could get on a plane and go to South Africa, and then we could come back and write a movie about, you know, making fun of people's accents in South Africa, and it would be fine. <laughs> but it's because I think it's this closed-off society that's very... not willing to participate at this time in kind of a global community that hopefully, if at some point, they decide to play ball with everyone else, <laughs> maybe it won't be such a big deal. <laughs> yeah. And that's probably why they are being targeted for this kind of satire is because they won't play ball and they want to be different and they want to be isolated. Yeah. I think it's a bad precedent, though. Uh, Pulling it? I bad. agree. Yeah. We, uh, we, it's free speech in this country. If you're not in this country, then you should uh, not care. Mm-hmm. This is this is this is the land of free speech. Look, and I think I and oh gosh, I can't agree with uh, Gingrich, but there is an element of that where that is an act of war because that is against everything that we stand for and are able to achieve. And as soon as it's sort of like it's sort of like negotiating with hostage takers, mm -hmm. right? You 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 do it to the detriment of the next hostage that is taken yep. or the next group of hostages that are taken because you paid last time, now they've taken more and they're going to continue to take as long as you pay because now they have a profit center. Now they have a way of causing leverage or, in, or having leverage and causing uh, outcomes. You must ignore it. You must ignore it. And the fact that Sony hasn't is un-American. Or that the movie theaters haven't. Yeah, the, yeah the movie theaters. Uh, so boycott them. You know what? I'm not going to a movie theater anymore. <laughs> Whichever ones aren't playing it. 
Whoever pulled it, I'm not going to see a movie in your theater ever again. I can boycott you for boycotting free speech on a really awful movie that I would not, <laughs> not have gone to see anyway. I have to say, now that I'm like watching the trailer, I might I might like to watch it. I would not I'm go to the theater. I would download it. This would be an at-home, popcorn at-home kind of movie. It looks like what was the last movie. one? The one with the... Uh, the Rapture? Yeah. Um, that was a great movie. I really liked I that, movie. that movie. Yeah. This Maybe is this the end. Is be a good movie. Maybe I do want to go see it. Okay. Well, on that note, I have to run. I have to go light some Hanukkah candles, even though it's way oh, after the sun oh. has set. <laughs> go do that. Yes. Get on with the candle lighting. Menorah. Yay. Are you doing that with your parents, or is it... Um... Yes. Since I happen to be here, it's perfect. Good. Cool. Well, have a very, very nice rest of your evening. Hey, where's uh, your bed? This is, this is the office. Oh, there was never a bed, bed back there? No. No. I'm not in my apartment. No, I know. It's the guitar background. So you're at the parents' house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I still thought you had a bed in this room. Nope. Nope. Oh. <laughs> I just curl up underneath the guitars like a dog. <laughs> that sounds not Happy really lighting. at all. Happy lighting. You win some good gelts and the thing with the spinning of the... Oh, choose wisely. Get the good chocolates. Have fun. I don't know. The good chocolates? Have fun gambling. Like Is it a gambling fish, chocolate? I don't even know. Oh dear. Good night, oh, Claire. Everybody, night, I'm going to take this opportunity Merry to head Twistmas. out. Also. Happy Merry Christmas. Merry Twistma Kwanzaa Hanukkah. That's right. And we will see you before the new year. Before the, yeah, I, after I say that, I, it's actually before, before the, the 30th. Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. What Tuesday, day is Tuesday? Tuesday, Tuesday. Tuesday, Tuesday. Tuesday. The 30th. Tuesday, the 30th. Yes. At around the same time. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for hanging out with us. We hope that you do have a wonderful holiday if you are celebrating whatever you're celebrating. No matter what, just take some time for yourself to relax and just focus on all the good things in the world around us because we're... Yeah, the bad stuff's trying to get into our heads all the time, so let's just focus on the good for a little bit. Take a few minutes sometime between now and the end of the year. We will see you on the 30th. Thank you so much once again. Happy Twistmas!